Hey everyone, welcome to the newest episode of On That Note with Parker Whirling. Today's guest joins me from Nashville, Tennessee. She's an indie pop singer-songwriter with a brand new single out right now called Spaceship. I'm really excited to talk to her, but before we get the episode started, please make sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to follow me at Parker Whirling and at on that note underscore podcast on Instagram. And on that note, please welcome Abigail Osborne. Before we start the episode, I want to tell you guys about something new that I've been drinking called Up to Good. They're a sustainably minded brand making sparkling caffeinated drinks from upcycled cascara. If you don't know what cascara is, it comes from the exact same plant as coffee where coffee beans are the seed and cascara is the fruit. This is what gives Up To Good its distinct tea-like flavor and also what naturally caffeinates it, which has been amazing for late night writing sessions when I need a little boost without the jitters, you know? They offer three all natural flavors, cascara mint, lemon ginger, and hibiscus berry. My personal favorite is the cascara mint that I have right here. If you want to check them out, they're on Instagram at up to good energy or order from their site up to good energy.com. You can even get $5 off their sampler box, which includes one of each of their sparkling caffeinated drinks by going to their website up to good energy.com and using the promo code OTN five off. That's OTN, the number five off all caps, no spaces. So make sure to go to their website, uptogoodenergy.com, and use that promo code OTN5OFF for $5 off their sampler box right now. I'm sitting here with Abigail Osborne, an indie pop singer-songwriter based in Nashville, Tennessee. Abigail, thank you for joining me for an episode of On That Note. Uh, I've been listening to Spaceship, your newest single, which is out now, but uh, it seems to be part of a string of awesome releases, Ruin Your Night and Pinball. All three are amazing. They sync really well together. And uh, as far as I know, it seems like it's coming off of maybe a, a debut album. Is that true? Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, yes, so those three songs are the first of this uh, nine song record that I'm putting out throughout the year. So it's been really exciting to just like start sharing the stuff that I've been working on for quite a long time at this point yeah it's always exciting when you finally get to start sharing the stuff you've been sitting on for a little bit and you know that people are going to enjoy what's uh what's the writing and the recording process been for these three songs or if there's one in particular you want to talk about and uh has there been maybe a different approach with these releases compared to you know your previous songs you've put out in the past Mm -hmm. yeah so um these releases have definitely been different than the ones i've done in the past the first two songs i have out is a song called drive all night and a song called break my heart um those were both made with two separate people kind of like incongruent from each other um there wasn't really a big rhyme or reason it was just like oh i wrote the song with these people i like it i'm gonna find a way to put it out um so with this new record, these songs, it was like the first time I was, it felt like a methodical way to release things and like wrote with the intention of putting songs on a record. So like everything felt very complete or like all these songs feel very complete as a collection. Um, so the first two that I put out, Ruin Your Night and Pinball, um, were both written with the same writing team. Um and we wrote those together and then um, I brought the demos like the fully produced demos to my producer Mark Siegel Um, and then we built the final like versions of the songs out together Um, and then Spaceship that one's like really special to me because I wrote it with my producer Mark um, and another artist that he produces for named Mena and 
that just, I don't know. I just felt like there was something in the room that day. I like came in with this idea that I knew was really special. And then we all kind of just like, I feel like knocked it out of the park, which like is a really good feeling. Cause you don't get that all the time. Um, and so then we kind of had the same process with that. We then got back together and finished the final version of the song. Once we decided it was going to go on the record. Um, and it's kind of been a similar case with the rest of the songs. It's like, once we knew we had a good demo and we knew we had something good, then that's when Mark and I sit down and like dive into the full production of it. Yeah. So that's interesting. It seems like there's maybe a lot more collaboration going on around with this album. When you're collaborating with somebody, how does that look for you? You know, you say you get a demo ready to go before you really start diving in. How do you know the demo's ready? And when you are diving in, what are you looking to improve? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, the collaboration process for me, it always starts with just, like, I always sit right here in my little home studio and come up with a concept or an idea or like a melody line before I bring it to any sort of collaborator, whether that be writing or production. Um, So from there, I take that idea to my co-writers Um, And I, I choose my co-writers based off of like, I have a few in my brain and I know exactly what their skill sets are. So dependent on the idea, I choose my co-writers based off of that. So I bring them an idea. And then um, from there, like we, we build demo together. Um, And I feel like I do a lot of things based solely off of like feeling. So I'll sit with like, whatever the day of recording is that we got and I it has to pass like the some kind of like check (laughs) that I yeah it's basically it has to pass the vibe check after so many days of listening through the demo if I still feel the same way every time I hear it and if I still want to keep coming back to it that's when I'm like okay this is really something here because sometimes it's easy to get like overexcited in the room if like all the vibes are really high and you're like this is it we just made the best song ever and then you'll listen to it a few days later and be like, yo, this song literally makes no sense. Um, (laughs) So there's like always that, but um, every song on the record, it was like, we, I found my co-writers, we wrote it together. The day of demo kept passing the vibe check. So then I brought it to, to Mark. Um, And then him and I, like, basically his brain is just like one of my favorites. Like his production brain is awesome. So Um, I'll usually bring it to him and be like, hey, here's the world I want it to live in. Here's the sounds that we've been using. And then he basically just takes it and replaces all the sounds with like better sounds and then hires awesome people to play on it and make it just like a cut above any of the demo sounds we could get. Yeah. Have there been any times during that collaborative process where you feel really strongly about something that maybe something else somebody else wants to change or vice versa and when that happens when people are on different pages how do you navigate that honestly I think I'm like one of the very very fortunate ones like it's a very rare case where like mine and Mark's brain feel very similar when it comes to like the musical choices we make like he talks about it he says it's like our tendencies are like the same and that is so hard to find um so honestly like we haven't had one case of that yet where he does something that I don't like or I have an idea that he doesn't like it's always just like I'll mention something and he'll be like yes that and then he'll add something and I'll be like literally you took the words out of my mouth so um that is like I just feel really really fortunate to have that because I know that's not the case for everyone and um yeah like just this we just finished up another song on the record last week and um I came into the studio and he's like okay go with me on this like I just these are just a few things I added and kind of went crazy but like let me know and he plays it and I'm just like those are those were all the thoughts in my head that I didn't even say and he just like did them before we even talked about it so yeah I don't I mean I'm sure when we or if we ever get to that point like it doesn't it feels like it'll be a non-issue because we're it feels like a really good communicating relationship we have that like, I don't ever foresee us having an issue really. Yeah. Clearly there's a very 
solid foundation there yeah. already and that is can be really hard to come by and mm -hmm. it's not even necessarily a bad thing if you do work with somebody or a few different people that bring different you know ideas to the table that you wrestle with and contemplate and try things out as long as you do have an open mind and you try things out because you never know sometimes you you get stuck in your own echo chamber and working with other people can really bring out a totally new side of this song that otherwise wouldn't be there if you weren't working with these other people. Totally. Yeah. I was actually just talking to a friend about that at an event last night, just about the idea of like, sometimes as artists, we get so stuck on this, like, I just need to keep everything in house and I need to be self-sustainable. Like that whole mentality of like production, mix, master, writing, everything needs to be just like done by me. Um, but I think if that, if we stay too far in that zone, we miss out on a lot of like opportunity for growth and a lot of opportunity for making our art something that we didn't even like envision it could be. Like the stuff that Mark and I are making now is like, I don't know, in my brain, better than what I could have envisioned and like definitely better than anything I could do on my own. So I'm a big uh, advocate for collaboration for sure. What do you think are some lessons that you've maybe learned during this creation process that you're going to take with you into future releases? Great question. I feel like I learn a new hard lesson every single day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> Just like in the music world, it's crazy how much there is to learn. Um, but I think the biggest thing I keep coming back to is like how much forethought I want to give everything. Like even with this record, I feel like there was a lot of like pre-planning that went into it and a lot of like, you know, just like I thought I had everything planned out and I thought I had given myself enough time to like hit every deadline. Um, but deadlines come really quick and then it feels like I'm always doing things rushed. Like last week I had a photo shoot and I texted my stylist like the day before the shoot and was like, ah, <laughs> I had a shoot and blah, now we don't have time to get like outfits and all this stuff. And and I think the biggest thing I'm learning is just to like give myself more time than I think I need to get a fully fleshed out creative idea completed in the ways that I want. Um, so I, I don't know if that makes sense, but I think a lot of creatives can relate to the like, it, it's not even procrastination. It's just like over committing <laughs> or like, <laughs> I don't underestimating know. I, how under, long yes, it's really exactly. going to take underestimating like yes all the details and all the time that goes into a release that you feel genuinely really good about and um the biggest thing right now I think that I'm focusing on is like um I spend so much time and energy and effort and there's so much planning that goes into the actual music but then it feels like everything else is kind of an afterthought so like visuals and like the right distribution rollout and all of those sorts of things I'm getting I feel like a crash course on that right now and I'm really grateful to have like some people that are helping me with all of that now but um that is a thing I'm, I'm learning a lot about is just giving myself time for the whole thing instead of just like I got a cool song let me put it out it's like so much more than that so so when it comes to this rollout what do you think maybe the average artist would miss or not think about when it comes to you know putting together a good rollout what's important to you that maybe you didn't even know ahead of time um i think how much time distributors actually need to give the song the best chance at doing something is like like in my brain when i was recording the record at the end of last year i was like cool i'll have the whole thing out by like september of 2022 um, and I just think the average artist doesn't think about how, like, it's like five to six weeks before the song comes out that they need everything. So that's like all the cover art, all the like extra photos, all of the marketing drivers, like your plan for what shows you're going to be playing while the song's coming out during release week. And like, the amount of like brain math that that takes to be like, okay, so right now it's, you know, November of 2021, but 
where am I going to be in the summer of 2022? And what shows am I going to be playing? And so then it's like reaching out to booking agents and then finding photographers and blah, blah, blah. Like, it's just like so much pre-planning and so much communication. And, um, and then there's also like budgeting that goes into it. Like, you know, so, um, I think that there's like a lot of things that can be missed. And so that's why all of a sudden it's like a week before I need to turn everything in and I'm reaching up stylists to, to have a shoot. Cause all of a sudden I missed a deadline, you know, um, that was a chaotic response, but that is like my brain. <laughs> when I think about like things that people can miss in releases, it feels like it's really easy when you're handling most things by yourself to just like let something fall through the cracks. And sometimes that one thing holds up everything. That yes. It's always like the chicken before the egg kind of thing. Mm -hmm. where it's like okay great this distributor is awesome and they want to help me oh shoot they need all this whole list of things and before I can get this list of things this thing needs to happen and right um so I don't know I'm just learning to be like patient with myself and like give myself as much grace as I can when it comes to all of that because like you know I I feel like I'm working really hard and if something slips through the cracks it's not that serious I will try again and it will hopefully I'll learn from all of these things and I think I I think I am exactly we'll I mean see. it is a <laughs> constantly improving process and something you think you are like doing great at now even in the future you might be like oh I probably still should have done this and this so letting one thing slip through the cracks you just try to take it on the chin and say all right next time I'll get them yeah Yep. I feel like I'm consistently just being like knocked down and humbled like every single day, but it's, it's really good. And like, there's never a dull moment. So it's good for me. So, um, I know you're also a songwriter for other people as well, like as a career, which is really cool. So other than the idea of practice makes perfect, how do you feel like your career as a songwriter uh, like writing songs for other people has helped you write for yourself. I mean, obviously you're constantly writing, so there's that, but do you feel like there's anything else about it that has impacted the way you write for yourself? Totally. Yeah. I think honestly, like I'm so grateful to be able to get in rooms with so many different kinds of people and so many different kinds of artists. Like the roster of people I'm writing for is like completely all over the map. Um, and I think more than anything it's just helped me like explore a wide array of like human emotion <laughs> and like it's helped me pick out all the similarities between people who seem so different but we're actually all just like way more similar than we think um so I feel like the biggest thing that I've drawn from everyone else I write for into my own stuff is like I pick out all the similarities and I'm like, where do people relate? Like, where do we all come back to at the end of the day? And like, what kind of verbiage feels most universally like accepted, I guess. And so in my writing, I tend to be very like kind of conversational and like stream of consciousness a little bit and just say things exactly how I feel them. Um, and I just find that like when I'm writing for other people, when I pitch lines that feel that way, they're like the most widely accepted mm. yeah if that makes sense um and it doesn't matter if I'm writing for like a country artist or like an emo indie alternative artist or like whatever it's like the honest the more honest the, the more like I don't know it cuts through like all the other stuff um so I feel like I, I always am just learning like the best way to say things and like the most um, I don't want to say like cutting edge, but like the most fresh, like way to say things. And because I'm, I'm always writing, I feel like I'm always learning new ways to like communicate things. Um, and then, yeah, everything honestly just like comes back to my artist project. Like it's helpful to write for other people too, to realize how much I want to be the one saying what I have to say. Right, right. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like I'm a sponge all the time, especially lately. I'm just like, all right, what's everyone doing? And how can I apply it to what I'm doing, you know? Yeah, it seems like you have to be a sponge. That's part of the reason why I started this podcast is so I could talk to artists like you and learn so much from 
what y'all are doing and try to apply it to my own stuff. And I think it is really interesting what you said about finding the best lines to communicate what you're saying, because there are ways to be very personal about certain things, but if you don't maybe phrase it in a way that is universally accepted, it might not get the response you want. Maybe you do want it to be a little bit more shrouded and mystery and be something for yourself and that's okay. But when I think about Ruin Your Night, like I know exactly what that song is about. And also I can't listen to it without laughing. Like it's so <laughs> awesome. like brutally honest. I think it's yeah. awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, that like when people ask what song feels like the most me right now as an artist I feel like that just like fully encapsulates the like what I'm trying to communicate um you kind of have to listen to the song all the way through to understand the full concept because at the end I flip it back to myself and I don't want to be like diss track girl like (laughs) I don't you know and so my hope is to be like a self-aware like diss track girl a little bit you know what I'm saying where it's like (laughs) it's like you can diss it but you can also turn the mirror on yourself and kind of acknowledge what's going on there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad that you pick up on that. Yeah. That was uh, a reason why I liked it, especially was because of the end. And it does feel like this full circle moment. Um, I did have uh, one more thing I read about you online uh, from Westworld. It was a write up about you. And uh, (laughs) you said no longer, uh, they wrote no longer having to skip out on meetings with producers and publishers to go to math class talking about Mm. how you went to Belmont and then you dropped out uh, and you went to study music business. And that's funny just because I was also going to go to Belmont for music business and decided to not to last minute. And I feel like I've met a lot of people who either did the same thing I did or went and then dropped out because they didn't feel like the courses were getting them what they could be getting if they just spent their energy full time doing that thing. How do you feel about that whole thing? You know, was it a hard decision at first to drop out or was it kind of like, I know what I have to do and it's happening? Mm hmm. Here's the thing. I could go on forever about this. Um, It's a podcast. We got a while. Yeah. I have, um, I think, more recently developed strong feelings on this matter. But um, I think, like, the biggest thing for me was I never really wanted to go to school. And I also never, like, to college. And I also never really had, like, big pressure on me to go to school. But I think I put this weird pressure on myself of like, I should get a degree. Like, that's what people do. Um, right. So I feel like my college experience was literally me just building up the courage to bet on myself <laughs> completely. And um, so I went to school for almost two years in Denver, um, which is where I was born and raised. So I was at school there for two years and just was like, very consistently confused as to why I was not having a good time. Like I had good friends. I was doing well in school. I was studying music business and like loved, you know, had like a pretty good experience, but was also just like, why do I hate this so much? Like, it's not that bad. Why do I hate it so much? Um, So then I thought the answer was that it was the school. I was like, I need to go to my dream school, Belmont. Um, So that is what like got me to Nashville, which I'm so grateful for. But yeah, transferred to Belmont the fall of 2019 um, and very quickly realized that it was not the school that was the problem. It was school in general that was the problem. And like, to be honest, I I got here, started going to Belmont and like all the wind was completely out of my sails. Like I did not think I was good at writing. I couldn't find people who I felt like I could relate to. I I was surrounded by a lot of people who wanted to like work in the industry and be an agent or a manager. And I was just like looking around being like, hello, (laughs) (laughs) uh, what's going on. And I was also like working three jobs to try to pay for Belmont and all of that. And so I, it just became like a pretty dark time for me. I almost quit music completely. Um, I was like, I think I'll just work in A and R at a publishing house or something. And just like, or do you like catalog acquisition or, or something like that. Um, and kind of had this mentality where I was like, as long as I'm like near the music industry, I'll be happy. Um, 
but I just like you know going to classes more and just like being around people who I didn't feel like completely like got me or that I could resonate with like just very quickly taught me that like I was like, no, I, I will like suffocate if I can't get all my feelings out some way. And writing songs is the only way I know how to do that. So, um, it was honestly this, I, um, met some publishers, uh, who came as like guest speakers to Belmont. Um, they're from a publishing company called prescription songs here in Nashville. And they're like the only pop publisher really here right now. And, um, they came as like guest speakers to this like songwriting club I was a part of at Belmont and I was just like having a miserable time and was like all right like I'm just going like there's nothing to lose here I'm just going to be really honest with whoever comes in to speak I'm just going to ask questions and not be afraid to ask whatever because I have nothing to lose so these people come in and they're talking about their careers as publishers and stuff and you know in my brain I'm like I think this is what I want to do I think I want to work in a publishing house um and so they all speak they're all really great I go up to them after and I'm like hey guys um do you guys ever feel sad that you gave up on your dreams to be writers to be publishers oh and they were God. like <laughs> thinking about it now I'm like whoa dude that was like not that chill of me to ask <laughs> but they all just are like I'm sorry who are you and I was like listen <laughs> Like, I don't know. So that just kind of like, we ended up chatting and I ended up becoming friends with a few of them and went and had like a meeting at their office. And they, they were just like very brutally honest with me. And they were like, if this is what you want to do, like, you need to just start saying it. Like, you're like hiding behind something and just like say that this is what you want to do. And I was like, wait, literally you're right. And it like, it was as though I had never, the concept had never dawned on me before. So I pretty much after that, I ended up like meeting some people at an agency here in Nashville who wanted to like start booking me for college shows, um, in like the college market. So it was that conversation with those guys at the agency that officially like did it for me where I was like, what am I doing in school? Like, I just want to play my songs and write them. And that's all I want to do. So um, drove from that meeting with the agency to Belmont to my advisor's office, run upstairs, walk in like out of breath, open up the door. And I was like, you're going to think I'm crazy. And he was like, you're dropping out of school, aren't you? And I was like, wait, yeah. And he was like, I knew you weren't supposed to be here from the minute I met you. I was just waiting for you to figure it out. And I was like, you could have saved me a lot of money by telling me that, <laughs> by telling me that way sooner. But anyways, that is the long story to say. It was one very tumultuous semester at Belmont that taught me so much. And like, I'm so grateful for the people that were just like non-coincidentally, you know, brought into my whole field during the time. And it's crazy what started to happen like immediately after I was like, you know what? I think I'm good at this and I think I'm going to do it. Like this full-time songwriting job came into my lap and then I started meeting other artists I wanted to write for and like met Mark, my producer and um now I just feel like the like real work has begun um but I'm like so here for it and so like I don't know like I'll have these moments sometimes where I'm like wow I really did just like completely drop everything else to like prove to myself that I was capable of something and um I'm surrounded by other people who also did that and it's like that's like why Nashville to me feels like I'm like a lot of places because there's so many people here who are just solely betting on themselves and that's it and it's really wonderful to be around that that's got to be very validating that whole experience after three four months whatever of you know kind of not lying to yourself but maybe (laughs) tricking yourself into (laughs) thinking you're supposed to do this one thing even though deep down you know and then you go meet these agents and if or uh, publishers and it feels more like a therapy session than anything else suddenly you know that light has been has been brought out and you know exactly what you want and then the universe rewards you for taking those courageous steps forward because it's not easy always to go after what you really want because then you have to face the fear of like well what if i don't get it exactly yep and that's like I have absolutely no judgment for anyone who's in that zone of like playing it safe and 
um, not completely just going all in on something because I I do understand what it feels like, but I didn't even know that's where I was like at the time. Um, and it was just really interesting how like everyone else could see it, but I couldn't. I was like, no, this is what I think I'm supposed to do. And like, even my therapist at the time, I like went to the Belmont Counseling Center, <laughs> um, which honestly, they were really great there. But um, this guy, he kept being like, yo, why are you here? Like, you do not want to be here. And I was like, no, but I think that I do like, you know, and he was kind of just like, and then my, my counselor even who was like, or my like guidance counselor, the one who was just like, I knew you weren't supposed to be here. I was just like, oh man, like now there's a few people in my life who I see kind of in that stage. And I'm like, it's such a personal journey for everyone. And I hope that people can get to the point of like feeling validated enough to want to go it all in on something. But it is, yeah, I think I forget a lot of the time how scary it is just because I'm so like at this point tunnel visioned and I'm like, this is it. Like, this is the thing I've chosen and I'm sticking to it. But if I think about it for too long, I'm like, oh, <laughs> wait a second. This is it. Hey, that was, that was weird. You, that was funny. You're just like froze and you were just like smiling. And I thought you were just staring at me, smiling for like way too long. And then I was like, wait, what's going on? I was like, what the hell anyway. is going on? <laughs> yeah. Is he having a stroke? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, can... yeah. I don't know what happened. I really hope that that didn't just like totally, you know, delete everything we had done. But either way, we would have the audio. So it's not too big of a deal. Okay, um, cool. But anyway, um, the last thing you were saying was um, about... Oh, like having empathy for people who are not quite there yet, right? Yes. Yeah, totally. What would be, I mean, I know it is a personal journey, but what would be your advice, I guess, for somebody who is thinking maybe that they should do something else, but they feel a little trapped? Mm -hmm. That, I mean, I think that my answer is kind of like uh, cheesy a little bit but honestly the older I get not that I'm that old but the older I get the more I'm like wait these cheesy quotes that were actually on to something yep. <laughs> um but like I don't know I think literally we get like one chance to live a life <laughs> and like the few things I'm learning more and more is like one nothing is really that deep or that serious so like the uh, like security of having like a really fancy title at your job or like the security of like finances and like th th that whole thing um to me personally is not worth the sacrifice of feeling trapped somewhere you know um and I think the biggest thing like in kind of taking the jump into something that feels a little less safe like usually that happens to be in the creative field I think that the biggest thing is just like weighing out what feels like the bigger loss to you. Like mm. is the stability, like the financial stability and maybe like the social aspect of having a, a like solid job. Does that sound like more What's fulfilling? Worth it? Yeah. Like what, what is more worth it to you? And I think that is literally just like the question to be answered is like, there are pros and cons to each thing. Um, and to me, I'm choosing to like, you know, some months are like awesome. And I'm like that my cuts, like my songs are doing well. I'm getting a lot of TV film placements, like everything's going well. And I'm like, this is awesome. And then some months I don't get any placements and like it, no one wants to record the songs we wrote and like that sort of thing. And so it's just like, the whole classic thing that like the highs are really high and the lows hit pretty low, but like that is still more worth it to me than feeling like at least I have the freedom to like wake up and be like, okay, here's what I'm going to do with my day. <laughs> um, and I'm not like answering to anyone really, except for myself. And again, with that comes pros and cons of like my personality type happens to be very like self-motivated and self-driven. Um, and that is helpful to me in this career field and some people might not have that so it might be a little harder for them to like get off the ground but um yeah I think it's just like answering that question that is the advice I have of like 
it's like figure out what the pros and cons are and then answer that question from there but yeah that's on the other answer. side yeah from the other side i like it over here so for whatever that's worth there's yeah that. i mean and everyone's different everybody has their own their own preferences maybe not everybody wants to have that super high super low mentality for their entire life some people want to have something more stable and you shouldn't you shouldn't just do something because you think maybe you're pressured to do something you should maybe really look inward and decide what's what's the best for you Mm -hmm. yeah but that comes with a lot like I in this whole journey of like choosing this as my like career that also comes with a lot of like self-reflection and I do like a lot of yoga and I journal every day and I like I think the biggest change for me happened and I started to see more growth in what I'm doing in my career when I started to like really focus on like being in tune with myself um and I think that's like a thing that's kind of left out a lot of the time within like especially I mean sometimes the music industry can be very like hustle grind culture and like I don't really think anything is going to happen until you're like centered with yourself. So Mm -hmm. that's like a whole other thing, but that is definitely also a really important aspect of it all. Very true. I think that's a a good note to, uh, to end on taking us over to the last five where I'm just going to ask you five quick questions and we'll be done. Cool. All right. Number one in the studio or playing live. Playing live. Yeah, really? I was, uh, I was kind of going to guess in the studio just because that's what you really seem to do most of. Yeah, we're, we're building a live show that I want to take on the road for like 10 years. That's like, (laughs) (laughs) there you go. So in, uh, playing live, not in the Mm -hmm. studio. Number two, what do you think is a perfect album front to back? Ooh, where's John Mayer 2001 nice perfect that is a perfect album i don't care what anyone says i have a square tattooed on my ankle to prove my love for that (laughs) (laughs) there you go i mean that is a pretty amazing album Uh, i haven't listened to it in a long time though but there's a lot of classics on it songwriting is unmatched that's where that was my crash course on how to write a song is that record i go Mm. back to it all the time what do you think is the best song on there or your favorite patrick's day Okay. St. Patrick's Day is the best. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> See, it's funny because I've, I've listened to the whole album once or twice, but I really only remember the like big hits. So I know the name yeah. St. Patrick's Day, but I couldn't tell you how it goes. But now I'm going to listen to it. Yeah, that one or No Such Thing. No Such Thing. If you listen, no such like, thing's great. everything we just talked about, that is like what that song is. And it's brilliant. Gotcha. Well, now, yeah, I'm going to go listen to it after this. <laughs> yes. Um, question number three, who's your dream artist or producer to work with? Um, this changes quite frequently, but as of now, I would love a collab between um, Holly Humberstone and Matt he- Maddie Healy from 1975. Ooh, yeah, Maddie Healy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you like I the think... new 1975 song? hot take i did not <laughs> Ooh, I'm, I'm i'm a little more with you yeah i kind of liked it but i didn't love it the way some people love it i was ready for like a heavy hitting indie pop jam like mm-hmm. um and it just didn't fill that void that i felt like i had from them but i still think that maddie's got some indie pop goodness left in him and i yeah. would love to to dive into something like that with him that'd be crazy Absolutely. I wrote down a, a few people I thought would be really cool. And one was Jack Antonoff. I think yeah, that, would that would be, be crazy. crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then Muna would be really sick. Mm-hmm. And then just to, you know, really shoot for the stars here, uh, I want to see you work with Harry Styles. Dude, you're telling me. <laughs> that would be such a full circle from my One Direction fan self to writing with Harry. You Give it a few years. One D we'll fan see. back in the day, or even now, still. Well, yeah, still their songs kind of still hit. I will be honest, but mm-hmm. I uh, had a YouTube channel with my friends where we would um, make gymnastics videos synced to all the One Direction songs. It's very embarrassing. That I hope is that. amazing. Oh my <laughs> yeah. god. 
<laughs> Anyways, I can't believe I just said that, but yep, that was a thing. I was. And what very... was the name of that YouTube channel? So we I can all. I unfortunately cannot <laughs> disclose that information. <laughs> but um, I was a big One Direction fan. I will admit. That's awesome. I uh, I saw them live my senior year of high school. I bought my I'm friend so tickets because it was her graduation present. <laughs> Uh, and right. they were awesome. they were amazing. I'm not gonna lie. I was one out of like 12 guys in the whole stadium, probably. But so uh, awesome. they put on a great show. That was five seconds of summer opening for them too. That and look at how far we've all come. You yep. know, I love exactly. It. <laughs> well, question number four is gonna be what's on your musical rotation right now? Ooh. Um. Okay. That song "What Are You Doing Now" by Sadie Jean. Okay. Um, Don't know it so good you should definitely listen to it and then there's a song called rookie by sam mcpherson that song okay. if i could inject it into all my veins <laughs> i literally would um i can okay, i'm gonna look it up <laughs> yeah that song is so good and i sent it to the producer i'm writing with today and i was like i don't know what we got to do to get a song like this but we we need to f- figure out how to make that happen um it's called rookie rookie brilliant that guy i would love to write a song with him he is awesome um so those are probably my top in rotation right now and then the new muna album obviously i love them i'm like very inspired by them um and uh their new record i'm gonna be honest as a hot take i didn't love the entire thing but there's a song called shooting star on there um that i added to like my spaceship playlist oh Uh, nice yeah, and that one is great. So that works theme wise too. It, you know, That's funny. this whole this spaceship playlist is kind of fire. It's all like moon and star themed. Um, <laughs> you plug the playlist. Everybody go yeah. check it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Moon is great, but I I listened to the album too, and uh it's just kinda hard for everything to live up to Silk Chiffon. Yes. You I know? was just talking to someone last night about how brilliant Phoebe is. Uh with that whole thing because I don't know if you know like the history behind that but she signed Muna to her satisfactory records and like people thought Muna was on the way down they were on the way down and then Phoebe was like I'm gonna take them and then I'm gonna feature on their song so then people will listen to it and then they had like this whole resurgence and it is brilliant yeah such a businesswoman she is (laughs) Phoebe is amazing I've got a giant giant crush on Phoebe Bridgers don't we Um, all so if she's listening Hit me up. Love you, Phoebe. <laughs> <laughs> Hit both of us up. Anyway, <laughs> last question here. What's your favorite decade of music? 90s. That's like pretty easy for me. That was no hesitation. Yeah. yeah. People are usually, uh, they take a moment for that one. No, I think that I was meant to be born like 10 years earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, it's funny because like all my friends are like 30 <laughs> and I'm like in my early 20s and I just relate to people who were around for more of the 90s and like my all-time favorites like yes John Mayer's in there but also like the Cranberries and Mm -hmm. uh Sixpence None the Richer like Lee Nash is like my hero that song Kiss Me is is like yeah gold is that Um, Sixpence None the Richer yeah okay my dad loves that song and I was like I know I know I know one song by that band but yeah. I wasn't expecting uh, that to uh, to come out right now. Yeah, that, like, I don't think you can really tell by what I'm making, but, like, I think I have, like, a 90s influence, like, flavor, if you will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that is, like, I think the pinnacle of, like, where I want to land as an artist, like, fully developed once I have a bunch of records out is, like, that I want it to all land in the space of, like, that. I think the 90s was, like, it just makes you want to like roll your windows down and wear Converse and kiss someone and dance. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I feel like that is like the overall vibe of nineties music. And to me, there's nothing like it. Like the rom-com credits, like soundtrack is like how I hope to soundtrack my life. (laughs) Yeah. Well, your three new songs to me all have that, that quality, that indie movie credits quality to them. And uh, I think everybody needs to go check them out. You got Spaceship, Ruin Your Night, Pinball. Ruin Your Night, is, I think, is my personal favorite. But they're all, they're all amazing. And uh, that's, gonna, that's, our, that's our show. Abigail Osborne, thank you for joining me 
for an episode of On That Note. Everybody go uh, check out the new songs and get ready for the debut album. Thanks for having me. Of course. All right, Abigail, I'll talk to you later. All this gravity and other detrimental... Thank you again for joining me for another episode of On That Note with Parker Whirling. If you haven't yet, please make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube and Apple Podcasts, and you can even leave a comment down below to let me know who you're listening to. On that note, I'll see you guys next time. If I had a spaceship.